with the words from the book of Amos and the confrontation between Amos and Amaziah, the priest of King Jeroboam in our minds about who is troubling Israel. Listen now to these words from 1 Kings chapter 18, the story of Elijah, reading the first two verses and then again at the 17th verse. Hear now God's word. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year of the drought, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. The famine was severe in Samaria. And verse 17. When King Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, have all Israel assemble for me at Mount Carmel with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. This is the word of the Lord. We are deep into the national political scene. Election mania. In debates and media interviews and advertisements, accusations are fired by one candidate against another and his or her own party and then against the candidates and the other party. And no matter what our particular political viewpoint may be, I believe we would all agree it is indeed a national free-for-all. And the more outrageous the accusations become, the more the media whips up into frenzy. The nation is disturbed. The land is troubled with so many words. Is it for good or for ill? Who is right and who is wrong? Well, I tell you this, not to discuss the politics of the day, but to set the stage for the conflict in Israel There is conflict in the land. Accusations fly back and forth between prophet and king. King Ahab and the prophet Elijah accuse each other of being troublemakers. And so I ask you, who is the troubler of Israel? Well, they both are. King Ahab troubles the land by his injustice, idolatry, and immorality. He abuses his power. He's lost his moral compass. He forgets his duty to God. He has brought devastation to the land, the covenant people of God. The land mourns. The land is in famine and drought. And here's the king. He's supposed to be God's representative on earth, worshiping God, pursuing justice, caring for the poor and the widow and the orphan. And yet Ahab and his consort Jezebel They abuse their royal power for their own evil ends. They are troubling Israel. Okay, but this evil king is right about one thing. Elijah is also the troubler of Israel. Elijah challenges the unacceptable aspects of the status quo. He confronts the king with the prophetic word. He calls the people back to the worship of the true God. He cares for the poor and the forgotten of the land. He honors the commandments of God. He seeks God's way of peace and justice. And because of all these things, he is troubling Israel. Now, as you heard in the first scripture lesson, this conflict between king and prophet is not unique to this one king and to this one prophet. Around a hundred years later, King Jeroboam's religious puppet, Amaziah, who serves as the priest in the royal sanctuary of Bethel, says the same thing, more or less, to the prophet Amos. Now, Amaziah is no righteous priest. He knows who butters his bread. Amaziah serves as the complicit court chaplain rather than as the priest of the living God. And God calls Amos, a simple man, a herdsman, a dresser of sycamore trees, 
to leave his home in the southern kingdom of Judah and to be uprooted and to go north to proclaim in the very household and the sanctuary of the king the truth of the word of God. He is no church professional. It's not his family business. Oh, no. But God calls whom God chooses. God sends Amos to stand in the gates of the house of the Lord and to proclaim the truth of God, for he too is a prophetic troublemaker who stands for the justice of God and the injustice of the kingdom. Now, we need prophetic troublemakers. Lest we forget what God demands and we become too comfortable with the way things are when the way things are is not always right when there is injustice in the land. Now this sermon is not about our current political debates, oh no, but it is about ordinary people like you and me, followers of Jesus, whom God uproots to love our neighbors and to serve the causes of God in the world, to be, in essence, prophetic troublemakers. We have all been stunned by the news reports that have come out of Flint, Michigan with their water crisis. For a year and a half, the people of Flint, Michigan, one of the poorest cities in America, have been drinking water that is contaminated with lead. And as you know, the problem developed when the city of Flint made the cost-saving decision to stop using the city water of Detroit and to draw their water out of the Flint River. And residents began to notice serious problems. They became suspicious of the water. Lee Ann Walters noticed how her children were losing hair, developing rashes, having abdominal pains. So she suspected the water and had the water tested lead poisoning. But in spite of assurances that the water was safe and denials from the public officials, she continued persistently to do her research and to expose the problem, the EPA became involved. A university research team got active. And because of Lee Ann and other troublemakers like her, this serious and deadly problem came to the public attention. It's finally we're doing something about it. All because of ordinary people who said no. And now one of her five-year-old twin sons is failing to thrive and developing other long-term problems. And we will not know what the permanent results and consequences of this poisoning will be for many, many years. You know, anyone can be a troublemaker. It doesn't take a loud voice and a pet cause. Oh, no, some like the kings and queens of Israel were troublemakers, troubling the land in pursuit of their own self-interest and narrow pursuits. But God's troublemakers have their eyes fixed on the kingdom of God and strive to help this, our human community, reflect the values that God wants, the desires of the living God for all creation, for all humankind. Did you read the report this past week in the Indianapolis Star that Adult Protective Services here receives nearly 40,000 calls a year concerning abuse and neglect of adults who have dementia, mental illness, handicapping conditions, and other problems? Let that number seek in. 40,000 calls a year. Investigative reporters said, how can a limited staff even begin to provide the, the research and provide the protection that our most vulnerable adults in our state need without more support? In response, officials in the state are providing an immediate $1.1 million to provide more support and work to respond to this crisis in need and also conducting a long-term study to see what is needed and necessary to provide support and care for our citizens. And I ask you, would this have come to the public eye if it were not for troublemakers who saw a problem and wanted to do something about it? 
Jesus was a troublemaker. They wanted to throw him off a cliff in Nazareth when he told his own synagogue that God's justice, God's love, God's mercy was not just for them alone, but for all people, including Gentiles and foreigners. Drop him off the cliff. Jesus was a troublemaker. He disrupted temple worship and said, Hey, friends, this is the house of God and is a house for all people, and you have made it a den of thieves. Get rid of him. Jesus is a troublemaker. He shattered class divisions and religious rules to create a new community of faith to love and to honor God and to care for one another. We're not going to put up with that. Jesus was a troublemaker. He gave people a second chance in a culture that really didn't much believe in second chances. Crucify him. Over the past few years, I've learned that there are a number of people in our congregation, friends in the church and community who are quietly giving their skills and their attention and time to working with adult men and women who have hit the bottom, who need a second chance. Some of these are ex-offenders who have paid for their crimes, who've completed their sentences and now are struggling to find decent jobs that They can support themselves and their families, and they can't do it because of their criminal records. Others they help have not had in their lives the kind of family support and encouragement that most of us have received in this congregation. The kind of nurture that helps us learn how to make wise choices, to set goals, to deal with conflict in healthy ways, to develop good work habits. Well, these friends and individuals are not only mentoring others, but they're working behind the scenes to change the system and provide new possibilities for those they have encountered in their ministry. You might say they are prophetic troublemakers, but they're not shouting from the rooftop. They're simply going about their ministry, their care, their love, daily, quietly behind the scenes, not with loud voices but with engaged hearts and determined wills. You heard how yesterday we enjoyed the Kenya Carnival here. We've been doing it here for a number of years, and we heard last week that marvelous discipleship moment from two of our seventh graders who are leaders in the Kenya Carnival effort. And we all know what it's about. We know that the purpose of the carnival is to raise money for scholarships so that a hundred children in Kenya who've been participating in our feeding programs there can now have the money they need to go to high school. And yesterday, 70 of our own youth and adults volunteered and joined with 100 other volunteers from across congregations in Indianapolis of different faith traditions to come and to open the doors and to welcome literally hundreds of friends who came to enjoy themselves at the carnival. We know all that. But what we may not really know and take sight of is something that is going on much deeper. And that is what our young people are learning They're understanding the challenges that their their peers in Kenya face who have no parents who've died of AIDS, who cannot even afford the $350 a year it takes to go to secondary school. They're learning about what a difference a high school education and even then a college education can, can make in Kenya, how it can blaze new trails and create new pathways. What are we doing? We're teaching them to become agents of change, of transformation. I like to think of them as prophetic troublemakers. So next time you see a middler in our church, there goes a prophetic troublemaker. We need prophetic troublemakers in our schools, in our businesses, in our neighborhoods. God's troublemakers have a love for the Lord, a passion for justice, and a heart full of compassion. And to be a prophetic troublemaker is not about power or position. Think about Elijah. He had nothing. Think about Amos, a simple herdsman, a dresser of sycamore trees. 
But they felt in their hearts the call of God. They listened to the word of God. They saw the needs around them and they were filled and led by the Holy Spirit. Now it is important to understand God's will and God's way as revealed in the Bible if we're to be a prophetic troublemaker, lest we go our own way and serve some God of our own making to protect our own little corner of the earth, our own self-interest. But the Bible teaches us to see the world, the whole world from God's point of view, God's perspective, to assimilate and bring into our lives the values of Jesus, to learn what it means to love God and to seek first the kingdom of God. You know, I like to think that prophetic troublemakers are simply those who embody in their lives the teaching of Jesus as found in the Sermon on the Mount. And so why do we come to worship? Why do we study? Why do we pray? Why do we serve together? Why do we care for one another? So that we may become more and more the prophetic community that Jesus envisioned. A pastor friend of mine was struggling with how to deal with a controversial issue in his church and in his community. He felt very unsure and uncertain about what to do, how to proceed, what to say, how to lead. And one afternoon, he was in an organ concert in an historic church not unlike this beautiful sanctuary. The sun was streaming through the afternoon western windows casting colored lights on the stone and on the faces of people. Sacred organ music filled the sanctuary. And as he listened in that holy, light-filled space, he wrestled, he prayed about these concerns. And then he heard not just the sounds of the organ, but he heard a voice in his mind that said these things. Have courage. Do what is right, and God will be with you. And then he knew what he had to do. And so I say to all of you prophetic troublemakers, have courage, do what is right, and God will be with you. Amen.